Imagine with me for a moment. It's dark outside. You're home alone. No one is supposed to be home for several hours, and so you kick back in a lazy boy chair with a good book, and all you can hear really is maybe a page turn now and then. Suddenly, the door blasts open, and with a bang, and your, your heart races, your, your mouth gets dry, you, you feel a bit shaky, and your breaths come in gasps. As you jump to your feet, to face whatever's coming in, you realize your palms are sweaty. A moment later, you realize that the wind blew the door open. No one's trying to get into your house. But for a moment, in a split second, your whole body reacted like your life was in danger. Your, your body was trying to help you to survive but really, there was no danger at all. Fear is a universal human experience. All of us have been afraid at one time or another. When we were younger, it was often a fear of the dark, fear of heights, fear of needles, of snakes, spiders, rats, dogs or frogs, or maybe the fear of the water. As we grow older, fears often become less physical and more relational. And we fear things like public speaking, making a fool of yourself in front of a hundred or more people. Intimacy, getting close enough to someone that they really know who you are. We might fear death or the process of death and dying. We might fear failure. What if our boss doesn't accept what we're doing? We might feel or fear rejection from those who are close to us or just whoever we meet. We might fear commitment as we see so many people do today in our society, waiting for marriage far too late in a sense because they're just not ready to take that step. We might fear being alone or fear change, that maybe we aren't gonna be able to keep up and at some point we just won't be able to handle it. Sometimes our fears grow into irrational phobias that trap people in a vicious cycle of ever-increasing paranoia and panic attacks. Many times people self-medicate with drugs or alcohol or go to a doctor to try to get a pill to help with the problem and, and yet they realize or maybe don't even realize that really all they're dealing with is their symptoms and not with the root issue. The fear is still there. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at our emotions and in particularly at the, the emotions that we struggle with that hold us back from living the victorious Christian life that the Bible talks about. The life of joy and peace and hope that so many times we see portrayed and talked about. And maybe even that we feel like the person sitting next to us in, the, in church this morning has and yet we feel like there's just something missing. We're not there. And today we look at fear. Many of you have probably seen a movie called Inside Out, particularly if you have young kids. And really, if you don't, it's, it's well worth getting and, uh, and watching. I think one of the key lessons that it teaches is that we need all of our emotions, not just the ones that we think of as the positive ones. I think that's so important for us to recognize that there's nothing wrong with fear in and of itself. In fact, a lack of appropriate fear is foolishness. Proverbs twice says in Proverbs 22 and 27, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. In the same way, the Bible encourages us to have an appropriate respect, reverence, and even fear for God. Because if we don't, we'll take him for granted. We won't treat him the way that we should. 
Most of us have never experienced the bite of a poisonous snake. And yet if we saw one sitting right beside us now, we'd probably jump up and flee the room. Why is that? Well, we have the sometimes unfortunate gift of anticipation, that even things we haven't experienced before, that we've only heard about or read about or maybe seen on TV or the internet can sensitize us and cause us to feel, feel fear. Anticipating fearful events can provoke the same response from us as actually experiencing it would. And of course, this can be a benefit to us. We don't have to learn everything from experience. If we had to learn that poisonous snakes were bad for us by experience, many of us would not be here today. Fear should be our friend. It's a signal that we need to pay attention to. It's our brain alerting us to danger to help us to survive. But when the brain doesn't return to normal after a stressful incident, when our thought processes keep on going that way, or maybe when there are too many incidents, this alert system that God gave us can turn toxic. We overreact or just try to repress our feelings and we get into trouble. The best response we can have to fear, researchers say, is to calm down enough to really think about what's happening, to accurately assess the risk, and rapidly return to normal when the danger passes. And the result is that we actually end up responding positively to danger rather than negative. We, we respond in an appropriate way. Unfortunately, some of us end up in what some people would call a negative loop about the situation that they're placed in, where, where the fear just keeps increasing, where they, we can't think about it rationally, where, where it seems like our body is out of control, our heart is pounding out of our chest, and yet we, we can't figure out how to stop it. Experiencing fear every now and then is a normal part of life. But living with chronic anxiety can be both physically, emotionally, and spiritually debilitating. None of us wants to live with high blood pressure. None of us wants to not be able to participate in daily activities that everybody else does without thinking and be frozen, maybe even trapped in our homes. God has not designed us for that kind of fear. But I want us to understand at the outset that just because you feel fearful doesn't mean you're weak or lacking in some way. God is the one who created your nervous system to respond that way. The problem comes when we allow our fear to rule us instead of using the fear the way that we should as a warning signal and then responding to it as God would desire us to. That is the path of wisdom. Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. You'll find that courage isn't even the opposite of fear. Probably peace would be more the opposite. And yet, courage is what helps us the most with fear. If our fear of failure means that we're willing to lie and cheat in order to avoid failure, then the Bible tells us that we've become fools. Instead, our fear of failure should cause us to draw closer to God, to depend on Him, to recognize that we can't do it on our own. We need Him. It should help us to realize that God is the only one who can lead us to true success. And then our fear of failure is actually a positive thing. I think that courage is doing the right thing in the face of fear. And it's important for us to understand this because we can learn the wrong lesson from the scripture I quoted a moment ago in Proverbs 22 verse 3 about being prudent and avoiding danger. 
Some people spend their whole life trying to avoid any possibility of danger. And while avoiding unnecessary danger is wise, it doesn't mean that we don't have to take risks. Far from it, God is calling us to a life that is lived out in faith. And faith means that we have to actually risk something. We have to step out and do something maybe that's a little outside our comfort zone because God is calling us to do it. Our scripture reading from Psalm 27 this morning said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That psalm was written by David, a man who knew both courage and fear. One time when he was fleeing from the previous king, Saul, who was after him trying to kill him because he knew that David was going to be the next king and wanted his own son, Jonathan, to be king. David kind of ran out of the frying pan into the fire and he ended up in a Philistine-occupied area. And he was captured and brought to the king. And we find that He feigns insanity. He he pretends to be a madman because he just doesn't know what to do. And they throw him out, and so he he runs away, in a sense. That was a time when when David maybe didn't respond appropriately, when he, he was overwhelmed by fear and forgot to say, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? But of course, this is the same David who faced Goliath, a giant, when he was just a teenager. And Goliath, of course, was a a battle-hardened soldier in full armor with all his weapons. And David senses that God is calling him to take that risk, to step out in faith because God doesn't want this giant to have a whole nation in fear. He tries on some armor, but it just doesn't seem right, and he realizes that it will hamper him, and, and he can't fight that way. And so he says, God, what do you want me to do? Well, use what I've given you. And so he he picks up some stones from a brook and a slingshot and you know the rest of the story. David was likely quaking in fear even as he faced Goliath. And yet he found the courage to do what was right, to do what God was calling him to do. And that's the David who wrote, Whom shall I fear? No one. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? No one. We see so many other examples in Scripture, both of people giving in to their fears, but also those who choose to do the right thing, who choose to follow God's way, even when they're facing overwhelming situations. Paul once shared a little bit about what he faced with the Corinthians in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he talked about how he'd been in prison multiple times for his faith. He'd been beaten and whipped, stoned, though not on drugs, of course, shipwrecked with no land in sight, sleep-deprived, cold and hungry, facing enemies and bandits people who were out to kill him. And yet in our text today, which I'll invite you to turn to in Philippians chapter 4, we find that this man who'd faced all these fearful situations that it was appropriate for him to feel fear. He says to the Philippians, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, I think it's always important when we read what someone says that we find out something about their life, particularly in the Bible. And that's why I just pointed out his story, because it's so easy for us to be reading along in Philippians, and we don't think about Paul's story, do we? We just think, oh yes, that's nice, be anxious about nothing. Nice for him to say. He probably lived in a padded room all his life. But that's not what Paul's experience was. And if you read Acts, you'll read about all those shipwrecks and and experiences that he had. 
And so when he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation covers being almost drowned, having no food, being attacked by enemies, stuff that most of us have never had to face. And what does he say to do when we are in those situations? He says, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. What fear, anxiety, or worry are you facing today? Can you listen carefully to what Paul has to say? Can you do what he's calling us to do? It's obviously what he has learned from his own experience. Now, of course, I don't mean that if you're in a car stuck on the train tracks, that the first thing you should do is say, well, thank you, God. Now, could you please help me? Obviously, God gave us a nervous system for a reason, and the most appropriate thing to do is to get out of there, get off the tracks. And in the same way, often when we're facing a a situation where we have fear and anxiety, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that God wants me to do in this situation? Because so often, it's so very clear. And this is something that I ask myself continuously when I'm facing a stressful situation, and I find it helps tremendously. If God's word has already said something about what I should do, then there's no question about what I'm going to do. I have to do what he's calling me to do. And I find that I'm a lot less anxious and full of worry when I know that this is what God wants me to do. If you're facing a stressful situation at work, maybe where an employer is pressuring you to lie or to do something, you know what to do in that circumstance. And yes, you may wonder what's going to happen if you refuse and they fire you, but you don't really have to worry because you know this is what God wants me to do. And so I know if I do it, God is my provider. He's going to help me. God is going to honor me for my willingness to do the right thing in this situation. And that solves so much worry and anxiety for me. And so I don't think that Paul is really talking about those kinds of situations. We can see from his life, he knew what to do there. Paul is instead talking about those other situations where we maybe have two equally good opportunities or maybe even more maybe we have 10 opportunities to choose from in a situation and we're like what does God want me to do here and we could get anxious about what if I choose the wrong thing or maybe we're faced with a situation where there are all bad options how many of you have ever been in a situation a no-win situation where it didn't matter what you did yeah many of us it doesn't feel very good does it and we don't know what to do. And maybe the, the immediate things as we think about what God's word says, the principles that God teaches to us, there's no obvious answer. And so we can end up worrying and being anxious about our decision. And this is where Paul says, don't worry, don't be anxious. Present your requests to God. Corey Ten Boom, who lived through the Nazi death camps of Auschwitz in Poland, wrote this, Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength. Carrying two days at once. Worrying does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And again, to me, her words are so much more powerful when you think of what she lived through. The hatred, facing death every day and starvation in that death camp. And she, she says, I learned not to worry about tomorrow, but just to focus on today and the strength I need for today. Sometimes we worry, what if I can't handle what's coming up? Well, I have news for you. None of us can handle what's coming up. That 
that's why we're Christians. <laughs> because we realize that we can't do it on our own. We need God, right? We're dependent on him. Most of us wouldn't be here today if it was just up to our strength, would we? We've had to depend on God in the past. And so not a one of us is equal to the challenges that will be placed in our path in the future. And so instead of worrying about that, we have to take comfort in the fact that God has helped us, right? And know that he's going to provide us the strength for today and yes, every day in the future. And so Paul tells us that our first step in those situations when we're tempted to become anxious and fearful and worried is to present our requests to God with thanksgiving. Those last two words are so key. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, I don't know about you, but thanksgiving is not the first thing that comes to mind when something's gone terribly wrong <laughs> to me. I tend to naturally think, not again. Oh, brother. And I start rehearsing all the other things that have gone wrong recently. And, you know, it's easy to start piling things up. But Paul says that's not what we're supposed to do. Instead, we're supposed to give thanks. Are we supposed to give thanks that Oh, thanks God for a lousy day. Thanks God for a broken down car. Now, I believe what Paul is saying is, again, that this idea, we have to look at the past and see what God has done and we have to take that into our situation. We have to, to recognize who God is. And so we say, thank you, God, that you have seen me pass all my previous difficulties. Thank you that you are here with me right now. Thank you that you have promised to provide all of my needs. Thank you that you are so much bigger than my problems. They are nothing to you. Now, Lord, I, I bring my request to you today. Help me. Do you see the difference that presenting our request to God with thanksgiving makes? Instead of looking at our problem, we start, we start looking at God. We start being reminded about how much he cares for us. And you know, sometimes I think when we're in the midst of a problem, even though we know this isn't true, we start to believe that God doesn't really love us, that he doesn't really care about us, that we've messed up so often that he couldn't possibly want to help us. And yet... Not one of us deserves his help. Not one of us deserves his grace. That's the whole point. We're all here. We're all sinners saved by grace. So why do we believe that lie? Can we instead begin thanking God for who we are in him? I am a child of God. You are a child of God this morning. Can you just say that? I am a child of God. And if you're facing fear and anxiety and worry today, remember that God takes care of his children. It's far easier when we understand that to face our fears head on. Like I was talking about when I talked about courage a few moments ago, that courage is doing the right thing in the face of fear. We can't run away from fear. We can't try to repress it or, or shove it down. That only makes it worse. We have to face it head on. And I really believe that that's another key that we see in Paul's life and even in this passage. Note that Paul doesn't say, you have no reason to be anxious. Just claim God's protection and provision. No, he says, in every situation, acknowledge the situation and give it to God. That's taking the fear head on. 
Not trying to run away from it. Admitting that we have a problem is not a lack of faith. The Bible teaches us a far more robust view of faith. Faith that says, like we read earlier in Psalm 27, though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe. We don't conquer fear or anxiety by trying to avoid it or repress it. This escalates our problem. It's what leads to people being locked up in their own homes, unable to go out because of their fear. If you're a Christian, Jesus said we would face opposition. In this world, you will have trouble. But then he encouraged them. and said, but take hope. For I have overcome the world. We can overcome too, with God's help, if we face our fears head on. And of course, the first step is, is to present our request to God with thanksgiving. That's one way that we face it head on. And Paul tells us in verse 7, the result of that. That the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which, which doesn't come from your circumstance and all that's going on around you, but it, it comes from understanding who God is and what he desires to do for you, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The second thing that I think Paul encourages us to do here in Philippians 4 is to reprogram our minds, to change the playlist. Or for those of you who are a bit older, to change out the audio tape or the, or the CD. You know, sometimes we repeat these messages to ourselves over and over. And Paul in Romans 12 verse 2 talks about how we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we find this in Philippians 4 as well. Paul goes on to say, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And the God of peace will be with you. Do you notice at the end there, once again, he's talking about peace. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think Paul has just changed the subject here. No, he's continuing on with this thought of how do you not be anxious? And he's saying, fill your minds with what God wants you to think about instead of those destructive, negative thoughts. You see, when people have problems with fear and anxiety, it's almost always the case that they spend almost all their time thinking about the negative things that might happen in the future, or all the negative things that have happened to them in the past that they think will determine their future. Do you find that you're always telling yourself negative things? I'm no good. I'll try, but I probably won't succeed. God wouldn't want to bless me. I've messed up too much. Nobody would really like me if they knew me. I just can't change. Or even, I'll probably die young. Those are all lies. When Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, think on these things, he's saying, erase that negative playlist from your mind and set up a new one. One that's full of what God says about you. I think of Scriptures like Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can read over that scripture again and again till it gets into your heart. And there's so many others like it that, that talk about 
what God has done for us, who we are in Him, and just who He is, what He's like. Identify what the lies are that you're believing and then focus on the opposite truth from God's Word. But you know, it's not simply enough to tell ourselves the truth. And I would say that that's a battle. It's not something you win in one day often. It's something we have to continually fight and struggle with. But even more than that, we, we have to act on those truths. It's when we act on truth that we see the results and are encouraged. And if we spend all of our struggle in our mind without ever doing what God is calling us to do, we will remain in our fear. And we see this in Paul's life. Does he throw in the towel when he faces one imprisonment or two? One beating? You know, you'd think that Paul might be excused for after the second time he was shipwrecked on a missions trip to say, you know what, I think missions is just not for me. You know, I think I'll be a local guy. Just stick around here. But he didn't do that, did he? He persisted in doing what he knew that God had called him to do. And some of us today, we may be telling ourselves the right things, but we're not acting on them. And that's where the step of faith comes. I'm not telling you you have to take a a giant leap of faith, but simply to say, God, what's the next step that I need to take to conquer this fear, to conquer this anxiety or worry? And I believe that he will show that to you. We have to face our fear. We have to act on the truth. Like I talked about before with courage. And you may not feel like you have any courage today. But courage is just obedience. And in a sense, when we don't act in obedience, we're essentially saying, I fear this more than I fear you, God. And I don't want to say that to bring condemnation, but just to to bring reality to our, our, our hearts and our minds today and say, God, I want to fear you more than anything else. More than the obstacles in my path. Lord, help me to fear you and want to obey you first. And Paul says in our passage today in Philippians 4 that he's discovered a secret. The secret of living in every situation, he says, whether with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And he tells us in verse 9, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Act on it. Don't just believe I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, but act as though that's what is really true. And I know that's hard. And yet, this is what Paul promises. And the God of peace will be with you. That you won't have that fear and anxiety anymore. Not that you'll never feel fear or anxiety again. Again, it's a healthy thing at times but that you will be able to conquer it and use it appropriately to respond as God wants you to do. That's exactly what we see Paul doing in his life. He steps out in faithful obedience to what he knows God wants him to do time and time again, no matter what opposition he faces, no matter how hateful people are, no matter whether things go all right or go all wrong. When he knows what God wants him to do, he does it. This is the kind of action that leads us to learn to overcome, to live the victorious Christian life that the Bible promises us. And so this morning, I want to encourage us today that we can conquer fear. We can live this overcoming life that the Bible talks about. But we have to live God's way. We have to respond as he is calling us to And it's hard to do that if we're living in so many unhealthy ways. So sometimes God will even prompt us to to start sleeping, to start 
eating right and exercising and other th healthy things that, that give us the energy to fight the fight that we need to fight. And I want to encourage us today, though, not to give up, not to give in. And this brings us to the last thing I want to point out about what we see in Philippians chapter 4 and Paul's life. Because in this chapter, we see Paul talking about how much the Philippians have helped him. And I want to point out today that the Bible is not a self-help manual. The Bible is a dependent upon God and interconnected with other people. <laughs> Help manual. It's a lot more than that, too. This isn't just about you and God. God has placed you in a body for a reason. And that's why we do small groups here at PPC is because we don't want anyone to be alone because alone all of us have our weak moments. Alone all of us will end up discouraged at some point and anxious and fearful and all those things and we might stray away from God instead of drawing to him and depending on him and, and getting our strength where we need it. And so we need to embrace community. That's why God made the church. And so if you're here today and you don't know anybody that you can depend on, I want to encourage you, go to the info center on your way out and say, I want more information about how to be part of a small group. We'll put you in contact with Hazel Shanks who just loves to help people become part of a small group. We all need a network of Christian people around us who will lift us up when we fall down, who we can lift up when they fall down. If we wait until we're in the crisis, until we're discouraged and, and anxious, we probably won't reach out. We won't know who to reach out to. And we'll have missed all those opportunities to be a help to other people around us that helps us even to feel like when we're in trouble that it's okay for us to reach out to others. It's okay. It's okay for us to not be okay in a small group. I want to encourage you to be transparent with others, to share who you really are, even if that's a fearful thing. And I want to encourage us today to not give up. Author Mar Marianne Radmacher wrote, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the little voice at the end of the day that says, I'll try again tomorrow. In our battle, our spiritual battle, and this really is a spiritual battle, there are days when we won't do so well. And the important thing is that we get back up after we fall down, that we accept the help of others around us. And so I want to encourage you, if this has been a major area of struggle for you and you have not gotten help, you may need to see a professional counselor. That's not a weak thing to do. It's a practical, God-honoring thing that God would call you to do to, to say, you know what? I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to get help. And so I want to encourage you to do that. But today, as the worship team comes, I want to also encourage us to just like every other situation, to give our fear, our anxiety, our worry to the Lord. I know what it's like to not be able to sleep at night. It's not a problem I struggle with often, but I've had occasions in my life where I haven't been able to sleep or have woken up just feeling tense. I can't imagine what it's like to feel that every day. And I believe that today God wants to set us free. That there are strongholds in some of our lives. Maybe it's not to that point where you're feeling it all the time. But it, you might say, you know, I struggle with fear and worry and anxiety. I want to be able to trust God. I want to be able to obey him in every situation. 
And I'm just going to invite us all to stand today. And as, if that's you, when the worship team begins to sing, would you come? Would you embrace the community today and say, you know what? I just want someone to pray with me and help me. In, a pra- in that practical way of agreeing with me in prayer that God is going to help me with my worry, with my anxiety, my fear. Maybe fear and anxiety isn't a regular struggle for you. And yet you're facing something today in your life. A work situation, a health situation, a family crisis. And you would say, you know, I I just need someone to pray because right now I'm feeling anxious. Right now I'm feeling worried and, and I need to give this to God. Would you come? Maybe there's some other need and you're not even that anxious about it, but you just sense God saying, you know what? You should come and present your request to God with thanksgiving. We'd love to pray with you this morning and agree with you that with God, all things are possible. God loves you today. He wants to meet you in your point of need. And so as you come, someone will just come alongside you and put an arm around you and agree with you in prayer. Let's do this as the worship team leads us this morning.